Look at that. Go. Okay. I think we got it. <laughs> All right. So we have a very, very special video today. George, I'm going to leave it up to you to introduce it. But as you can see, I am sitting here live in person with George. Very, very cool because I always talk to George when he has a new product out, but it's never in person. No, so, this is actually the first time we've been able to go over something new, exciting, interesting like this. And in person. I'm pretty excited. I'm pretty so excited. I'm just, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, this is the first time we've done it this way, even though we've been kind of working together for, geez, about 2016, 17 yeah. time frame. Yeah, it's, it's been a while. I mean, I, I remember very well getting the first... I, I remember it because I was... It's one of those products where... Sometimes you're really excited, even though you have 100 vapes, you know, you see something that was like, I remember seeing the Dynavap for the first time, I'm like, I gotta get one of these. So I was really excited to get that in. And it's amazing to see where that started and where it has come. So please introduce- uh, Here we are. So, let's start this way. Yeah. Introducing the M7, right? Close up shots. Close-up shot, Coming beauty, in. beauty yep. B-roll here, yeah. Uh, let's talk about why, right? So we were having kind of our product discussions months back, mm -hmm. okay? What are we gonna do? You know, we had the M Plus, certainly different than what the 2021 version M was. Yeah. Okay. What are we gonna change? What should we change? What are people looking for? And the responses were very divergent, right? Well, we got to find a way to bring more quality, better performance, but we need to find a way to lower the price. Okay, these things are kind of opposite. Right. How, how are we gonna right. do that? Better, cheaper. Right. So how do we do that? And so as some of the thoughts are going back and forth, it's like, well, maybe we should do everything we can to simplify the device while retaining as much of the performance as we possibly can, see if we can even figure out some ways to refine the experience. Because we know there's people looking for a simpler device. We've had feedback, comments, say, just stop with all the fancy machining, just give us a solid, simple device, just works. Sure, right, okay. Sounds like, okay, maybe we can also make something with a, little, a few more options that maybe actually cost us a little bit more and we can have both. So, how about we have M7, and then maybe we have an M7XL. <laughs> so now we can have a separable mouthpiece, or we can have just a straight, simple version that we did everything we could during the time frame that we had to simplify the product. Not just from looks and appearance, but how do we retain as much of the performance as possible, yet simplify our ability to manufacture it so that we can then pass on the cost savings for us to make it simpler and more economically yeah. and offer a product that is just more streamlined, more simplistic for the people that are looking for just a simple, high quality, bulletproof, last you a lifetime thermal extraction device, right? And then at the same time, if you're looking for a little bit more of a higher end, fancier XL version, separable mouthpiece, get some of the characteristics like with the woodwinds, some like the Omni XL. Yeah. But in a stainless version. So here we have the M7 in two forms. We're gonna have two different variations of the M. That's pretty cool. For this generation. Very cool. Now do you have a favorite of the two? Oh, uh, it's like it's like your favorite child, you know. Yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. It's, it's tough to. But but I really like the question because in general I tend to prefer the smaller versions of the products, right? Yeah. The ones that fit in my hand. But then we have the Woodwind, which is the same yeah. size as is the M7 XL, and I really like the M7 XL because of this, right? Yes. This just makes me smile. And these have gone through some refinements from oh. the old days. Oh, absolutely. So as we introduced with the Woodwind, for example, the change things up, you know, metal mouthpiece, no orange on the condenser. Yeah. And the condenser just integrates into the mouthpiece without any O-rings as well. And we've done that by 
uh, changing the geometry a little bit, both on the woodwind mouth uh, condenser as well as on the M7 condenser, okay. by cutting a couple channels, which allows us to make effectively leaf springs or cantilever springs. And you'll notice that there's just a little bit of a, a, a ring yeah. that's left machined into the end, which then allows for a little bit of frictional oh. interface okay, wow. without the need for an O-ring. So the M7XL has the same number of O-rings as the M7. It just, instead of the two quad rings on the condenser, we now have two of the same O-rings as on the tip on the mouthpiece. That's cool. And the thing that's really fun is when we look at close up again, right, when I put this together, mouthpiece is on the tip side, right? But we can flip these things end for end, and a big part of what the design process was is not only streamlining the design, but making it so that the tip looks good in both ends of the stem, right? We hold them end for end, you can see the tip in this end of the yeah. stem versus the tip in this end, and they both flow visually. Hmm. Now the mouthpiece doesn't look quite as good when we stack the mouthpiece on the taper. We still have that yeah. 10 millimeter taper. Okay, okay. excellent. But uh, now when we switch things around, we can put this mouthpiece on the tip side and we get what looks like, a, I think, a pretty nice little integration. Yeah. That looks pretty smooth. So, in the first, if we're if we're going back to you know, what is the most O rings that has been in a Dynavap? Like what? What is so that that would have been the Omni. Okay. The the original Omnis had three O rings on the mouthpiece, one O ring on the condenser, and four O rings on the tip. On the tip. And so, how many are we down for the M7? So now the M7 is down to four. To four total. O -rings. Four total O rings. Wow. Two on the tip and two on the condenser and or two on the mouthpiece that holds the condenser. Right. So. I, I always I always like, uh, it always sticks in my mind, I remember asking you about the O-rings one time, because people ask us, can I put the O-rings if I'm cleaning it, can I put them in ISO? And I, I remember you explaining <laughs> to me that if you needed an O-ring that could hold alcohol in place, this would be a suitable O-ring. That's correct. So if you're gonna build a machine that, say, pumped isopropyl alcohol. Yeah. Okay. And you needed to create a shaft seal on a rotating component that would be exposed to isopropyl alcohol. The material that these O-rings are made from would be a good choice because it would <laughs> withstand the exposure to isopropyl alcohol for a very long period of time with no substantially detrimental effects. Right. Now I, I do understand the question because there's like, if I put my I put my volcano hybrid heating chamber in isopropyl alcohol, and you, it says you're not supposed to, but I'm like, oh, whatever, you know? And I can tell it's a little Off. brittle almost. Okay. Like it doesn't, it feels like it's changed the plastic. So I, I understand the question, but that's, anyone wondering, you can put your O-rings in ISO that's probably what you. I always recommend to people take them off as least as you can because that tends to be when you break them is when you're taking them off. And you know, I would completely agree with this. You know, it it's slightly off topic specifically from the M. However, uh, it's very much on topic with who we are as a company, right? Do we like selling orgs? Absolutely, we do, right? Uh, same thing with the CCDs. Yeah. But it doesn't mean we're designing them to fail. Yeah. Right? Because the, a huge component of what drove me initially and I think drives everyone on our team at Dynavap is if we're going to make something, let's make a product that is the kind of product that we would want to buy as a consumer. Because, yeah. I mean, really, what consumer wants to buy a product that's going to fail? Yeah. Right? I mean, Sounds... yeah, I know sometimes we buy tools at Harbor Freight because we don't care if they're going to break because we're going to do something really nasty and we can't justify using a really nice tool for that. Right. Well, okay, that's slightly different. You know, we buy paper plates with the intent that we're gonna throw them away. But when we're buying a device that looks like it could last for years and is really engineered to last for generations, well, that's our design philosophy. We are not designing our products or the components of our products with, uh, what, are the, what do they call it, uh, engineered obsolescence. Yes, okay? yes. We're designing them to be as practically durable and long-lasting as we can realistically create them to be with the materials that we have available at our disposal at this moment in time. Yeah. Okay. And 
I, I feel a, a little bit of a gratification when I look around and I see that there's people that have bought products from us back in 2015, 16, 17. So yeah, I've been using my product since I got it, you know, multiple times a day, yeah. almost every single day of the week. And yeah, I've only replaced one O-ring or yeah. I haven't replaced any. Yeah, still on my original CCD. Right, because these things are possible. And I'm not saying that it's going to be that way for everyone. Yeah. But we generally do our best to engineer our products to be as durable as we practically can be. And selecting the right type of O-ring was a huge component of that. Because in the early days, we used silicone O-rings. Mm -hmm. And they work good. Yeah. They handle heat just fine. They also handle isopropyl alcohol reasonably well. But they're really soft. Mm. Okay. And that's a big part of the reason why we switched away from them. They... they they would rip and tear much right. more easily, especially with our less sophisticated tolerances products and, and tolerances that we yeah. used to have on, on the previous things, especially, you know, with the tips and the O-rings going into the wood devices, the tie woodies and the yeah. longs. The the, the the texture of the wood alone would be enough to kind of start to tear up the O-rings. Sure. Okay. So here we are. We made that switch. And it brings me to, I think, another really important point, and that is the color. Okay. Mm. So talk about color just a little yes. bit, right? So you may have noticed that the color of our O-rings changed back in the 2017-18 time frame from black to gray. Yeah. Okay. Why did we do that? Well, I did that for one really important reason, and that is if you go to buy O-rings, you need to know, number one, what size are they, okay? So you can buy these quad rings, okay? It's a 007 or 008 in case anyone's knowing, because I'm not trying to hide that information. Yeah. Uh, but if you go to an O-ring store, supplier, Amazon, whatever it is, to buy the O-rings, okay, you can get the right size, and they're going to fit, and they're going to work. But what a lot of people don't realize is that O-rings are not O-rings, okay? Just like beer is not beer, okay? You can have a bourbon barrel aged stout, okay? Yes. Or you can, you can have a really light non-alcoholic lager. They're both still technically beer. Yeah. But they're complete opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. So when it comes to a thing like an O-ring, okay, and this is what I was running into when I'm seeing people, you know, online writing about, well, you don't have to buy the O-rings from Dynavap, you can get them cheap from, from the hardware store. And the answer is, you technically can, but you may not want to, and here's why. So we're talking about black O-rings, okay? You can get a black O-ring in Duna, you can get it EPDM, okay? You can get it in FKM. You can get it in silicone, okay? And that's just the four common ones. Oh, you also get a neoprene, okay? Mm. They're all black, yeah. and they're all the same size, and they'll look the same, and they all feel pretty similar. They have temperature ratings that are vastly different, Oof. okay? And they have nice. chemical resistance that's also vastly different. Why are all these different O-rings out there? Well, do you want a light non-alcoholic beer, or do you want a barrel-aged stout? Right. Okay, there's different elastomers for different purposes, different intents. And so sometimes you want a really soft O-ring that can handle really high temperatures but doesn't need chemical resistance. Hmm. Sometimes you need want a more stiff O-ring that can handle high temperatures, okay, but doesn't have these characteristics. So O-ring selection is a bit more complex than it might seem on the surface. And to aid in differentiating this whole process, it's like, okay, how do we make our O-rings easy for a person that doesn't know and understand O-rings to know that they have the right ones. Yeah. So we first off started changing the color. I'm like, okay, what color is going to go good with our product, regardless of whether it's metal or wood, and also be a color that's very not common with O-rings. Okay. And so I selected gray. Okay. And then a little bit further down the path, uh, and I think this is really fun, like when I pull the O-rings off the condenser and I put them down here like this. Yeah. If you look at them, when they're right next to each other, you can see they're different colors. Mm -hmm. You can also see they're slightly different size. Yeah. Okay. But if you've got three, four, five, seven, ten, fifteen, twenty O-rings all in a group, it becomes really hard to tell the size apart. But since they're a slightly different shade mm. of gray, it that becomes much sense. easier to see which O-ring is which. Right. Okay. Especially if your eyesight's not that good. So we didn't just change the color of the O-rings. We changed the color and we differentiated the O-rings with shades so that it's easier for people, whether it's your use a consumer or a wholesale retailer or us on the manufacturing side, 
to very clearly visually differentiate one size from the other. Yeah. As well as to ensure that we are not, uh, or that it's easy for people to tell the type of material that the O ring is constructed from. Yeah. From one another. And so you don't have any your neoprene O rings, huh? Right. Well, <laughs> and, and neoprenes are great O rings for certain applications. Sure. But they don't have the temperature resistance that you'd want to use them on a tip, the for tip. example. Yeah. Right? Because these things get hot. Yeah. Okay, so you need to have an O-ring that can handle the temperatures that are commonly associated with the way that these devices function. Right. So there's kind of wow. a whole aside into O-rings. Into O-rings. Wow, that's, that is interesting. I, I did notice the change, but not the why. Now, I want to talk about this tip a little bit here. This is, I mean, it's got to be... The Helix is certainly interesting, but this is interesting in its own unique way. Like, what exactly do we got going on with this tip? Okay, so we've got several really fun things going on here. Um, it, it really felt like during the development of the M7, it's like, okay, we've gone through this process six other times. What have we learned, and what do we really want to do if we just open up the, the playing field here to, okay, if you want to make the M that you've always wanted to make, what are you going to do? And so we, we created a couple different categories. First, we've got the tip, we've got the stem. So if we're going to start with the tip first, let's go there. Okay. So we've learned through the B, which we got rid of all the fins except one. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the M+, plus, which was our first finless tip. Yeah. But okay, if we go and place a nice little piece of mass mm -hmm. right underneath the chamber, that actually is kind of nice. Yeah. Because you know, now we can put that mass where it holds heat basically right where we want it to be. Yeah. So, okay, how do we optimize the placement of that mass and then optimize the shape of that mass so that we can get the most benefit from that mass? Mm. And so that's a big part of why this shape is what it is. Okay. So. Here, shift the mast as far forward as we can. In yeah. other words, take the mast the fins would normally take up and just kind of mush that up this way. Yeah. Okay. Cut a couple grooves through it so that when the cap is installed, right, as air is coming underneath the cap, it's going to cut through some of these little grooves. Yeah. And it picks up some of the heat from oh, this okay. mast. Sure. It's going to stay hot longer mm. because it's a large, thick chunk of mass right, right. there. Okay, and then even better than that, when we shift as much of the mass up this way as we possibly can, we reduce the ability for heat to transfer, or like I've been saying, to go down the drain into the stem. Okay, right. because every little heat unit that leaves the tip and goes into the stem is a unit of heat that is not doing any work for us. And if anything, it kind of gets in the way because now our stem's getting warm. Yes. Okay. Sure. That's nice if you want to warm your fingers, but. That's not why this device is between your fingers. That's not why I usually use mine, no. No, not at all. So, okay, let's thin this down as much as we practically can while still making a device and a component that's not likely to fail due to yeah. it being too thin. Yeah. So we reduce how much heat can go down the drain, shift all that mass up underneath the chamber where it can do some work, it can store some heat, it can preheat more air, it can stay hot longer. Yeah, that's good. That's what was kind of the driving uh, design intent behind yeah. this shape. Yeah, I like that. Now, the I notice here we, it's much smoother on this it section is. here. It is. Now, what's the, what's the reasoning for that? Okay, so first off, uh, back when we created the, or the captive cap and started mm -hmm. that transition right yeah. through the captive caps, and a little quick aside on there, I know there's still this school of thought that I like the non-captive caps or I like the captive caps, right? Well, just want to kind of set the record straight here. All caps can easily become non-captive caps, okay? By just simply squeezing them the way we used to squeeze them, mm -hmm. okay? Put the digger outer on your thumb or your index finger and squeeze them this way. Yeah. The captivations get pushed out of the way, and the cap contacts the tip the exact same way as all the non-captive caps, because this is what we used to do. We used to take the caps and we'd just physically squeeze them between yeah. our fingers and adjust them until they fit right. Yeah. If you don't like the cap, the cap. If you do, or if you want to play around with it, well then you just turn it 90 degrees and you squeeze on those captivations yeah. to adjust and to calibrate the fitment of your cap. Yes. Which we've made videos on that, but I think both you have and we have. Yeah. 
And I think it's really nice in the regard that now here we could make a little adjustment. And because of the texture and the, the proportions here, when I put this cap on, okay, we're going to notice that it is loose. Yeah. Okay. And then when I get right to the end, it makes just a really nice little snap. Yeah, clicks little, into place, just, right? and, it's, and it's tactile too. Oh, it's super tactile. Yeah. And you can adjust it so that there's just a tiny little bit of friction. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you get just to that point, just a little bit of friction, hmm. it makes that little wow. snap just really distinct and it helps inspire the confidence that this cap is not going to go anywhere that it's not supposed to. Yeah. Because it is clicked into position. Locked in. Locked in. Wow. Ready for action. Ready for action. And then you got a nice, nice crown up here to. Oh yes. Stab, so twist, pull. It's 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 the next generation of the septa serrated crown, right? Wow. You know, because again, you know, there's seven little points and seven yeah. little divots. Yeah. And uh, dialed it in a little bit more, as you're going to notice when you go on your finger, it's it's yeah. not it's not dull. No, it's like it's it's not sharp. But if you put some pressure, I think you could carve a little slice of peat in your bowl if you wanted. Sure. You know, you, you, know, you know, cut little bits out of an apple or whatever it might be. Yeah. But what I preferred is now you can pinch that you know, whole nub right between your fingers. And uh, I particularly like, you know, because we've got the, the tip neck down like this. Yeah. Okay. You can rotate and get more of a rotation because the yeah. diameter is smaller. Yeah. And so cool. you can kind of twist and grind mm. right oh, off of okay. the nug. Wow. into your fingers. So this is the motion that I like. I come in contact, I start yeah. to rotate, twist, and rotate my wrist. It's kind of cool. And you can grind a little bit right into grind your chamber. Into the chamber. And so, yeah, so what do you have? If you got a whole little nug, you got one of these, and you got something that's hot, you've got everything. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much what you need. <laughs> is that fun? I mean, I'm, I'm having fun, that's for sure. Now, Tell me this though, you were kind of alluding to this when I was talking to you yesterday, but this is going to be where the beautiful B-roll shots come in, but you know, you've gone away from a bit of the more radical texture, shall we say, that we've yes. seen on some of the old M's, but this is still very textured. Yes, it is. Yeah, so how do you how do you describe this finish to someone who hasn't held it in their hands yet? That's Probably one of the most challenging things for us to do is because, to the best of my knowledge, there are no products on the market that have a finish like this. Okay, this this is something we've been developing for several years. Uh, it kind of made its first debut on a few of the the Vong sleeves mm. and some of the really short run customs things that we did, and then of course uh, with a texture that was a little bit uh, controversial in in some. Regards, you know, with the M plus, okay? Yeah. Because the M plus, we maybe push things a little bit uh, to the extreme. Too far, too soon. Of, people yeah, weren't. people weren't ready for it. It, was, it. it kind of made me think about like the the yoke that uh, Tesla put in their cars. Mm. Some people are like, "Oh, that's awesome." And yeah. Others were like, "Oh, I hate it." Right. Uh, it's just controversial, right? Polarizing. Polarizing. Yeah. So, all right. But the texture is something that we can do that really differentiates our product. So how do we take what we've learned, incorporate some of that feedback, and give people something that is still something that they've never seen before mm -hmm. and never felt before, but maybe make it just a little bit less in your face? And I think that's where we landed. We still have some pretty interesting optical characteristics. Oh, yeah. When you change your viewing angle, it's like... Really? I always feel like when I look at the, you know, just as you guys have got more intricate over time, I always feel it's like one of those, you know, you have to unfocus your eyes pictures sometimes. Like, what am I seeing here exactly? Because it's like there's layers and there's complexity layers. within yes. it, right? Like, yeah. that's what is kind of interesting. It's, you know, I, I notice when I put it like this, you really see this kind of, it almost looks like a carbon fiber kind of, right? Isn't that like, fun? yeah. But it's metal. It's metal. And it's just through a process that you guys have, like a unique process. You've yes. So it's it's through a custom built machine uh, that we made during the, the development, believe it or not, for a product that never quite made it that was going to end up being the bee, but uh, through some feedback, it ended up not becoming. That doesn't mean we're not going to further explore in that direction. Yeah. But now we have this really interesting machine that allowed us to control some variables that we've never had the ability to control before. 
And how else do we describe it? Well, if you've ever seen like the holographs on like the baseball cards, the reflector mm-hmm. cards, and they kind of change depending on your angle, this doesn't have so much the coloration, but it certainly has that optical play with the light and with your eyes. And it's got a little bit of a nice tactile sensation to it. Yeah. It gives you some grip that it's not the same as like the grip that's machined in on um, like the 2019, the 2020, yeah. and the 2021 version. And it's a little bit more subdued than what was on the M Plus. Yeah. yeah def- but it definitely, like you say, it's grippy. If I'm holding my fingers on this smooth section, I mean, it moves around on my fingers. But if you put them here, it doesn't want to move no, at all, it's, it's, right? It's, it's got the... It's, it's for control, right? Like, it's like it doesn't... It only feels grippy when you're gripping it, maybe. You know, it doesn't, like... It feels very smooth until you're kind of... And then it's got... Yeah, it's, it definitely doesn't have the feel of a polished metal object. Yeah, yeah. So for anyone who didn't like the the maybe extreme nature of the previous iteration, this is going to be a more subdued, yet still interesting option. And I think it just gets more interesting as you use the device, because as your perceptions start to shift a little bit, it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> really? Oh, what? Oh, it kind of does this too. Hey, did you see this? Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's some depth there that I, I'm really hopeful that people are going to find, and when they experience it, they're going to enjoy it. Yeah. And just really appreciate the fact that okay, so I I didn't think that they could really do that much more, that much different with a simple metal tube, but they, they did. did. Yeah, they did. They they figured it out again. They got something new. So tell me a little bit about the airport and the rocker scenario here. This is a, this okay. is a new airport. It is. So for starters, we as much as we practically can, we want the airport to have functionality. Yeah. It's got to work. But at the same time, we want it to make sure that it looks like it flows with the theme of the device. And so the intent was to create a shape that kind of flowed with the textured pattern, okay, but also when holding the device in the way that we've yeah. kind of all learned to use the device between the thumb and the index finger and then just to kind of slowly rock yeah. it on the rocker so you could modulate that airflow that as you're uncovering part of it, you end up with uh, not just all the way open and all the way shut, but you can kind of ramp up and ramp down yeah. your air and vapor ratio. So not not a switch off and on, it's, not just a, a switch. it's a dial. Yeah, exactly that. And then on the back side, uh, I think the the, the the precision pivoting uh, pivot point yeah. right, was kind of fun, but uh, we wanted something that was going to kind of flow with this one, so tried to, again, how do we do it? How do we incorporate it? Yeah. And when I think about tactile elements, tactile geom- geometries with the product. The goal is to make a device that if I can't see and I hold this device in my hand just without even looking at it, I know the orientation is some the way that it feels. Yeah. And once I've done that now I can actually position it comfortably between my fingers and know exactly where they are at. I know that mm, yep, you know, there's the airport under my thumb and the rocker's under my finger but I don't have to look at it I know that yep, tips over there because I can feel that step down for for the tip, yeah. or I can feel you know the uh, the taper for the mouthpiece end. Being able to position the product precisely without having to look at it, I think, is important. Yeah. You know, especially from the perspective that so many of the devices that we interface today are all very very visual. Okay, because visual coordination it's kind of second nature to most of us. Yeah. But it also requires kind of a different way of handling things. When we just simply know, you know, for example, when I'm walking up and I'm just going to slip my feet into my shoes without having to bend over and grab them, okay, what am I doing? You know, to a large extent, I can feel when my foot's going in and then I can finish the uh, the motion without having to look at it. Yeah. Okay? And... It's, it's these specific activities that just, personally, they resonate with me. Okay, I appreciate products that I don't have to look at and focus my eyes 
in order to properly use them yeah. because it just requires less strain. You know, just, yeah, I know how it works. Yeah. I, I can take my cap, you know, I know I got this digger outer right here, and as I'm bringing the tip in, I can actually hit the digger outer with the tip, yeah. and it functions like a guide. Yeah, right. It, it's not just a scrape thing. Like a shoehorn. Absolutely, it's, it's a guide. Because if without that, right, we've got a tip that's a diamond that's just slightly smaller than this, and when you're trying to align sure. round things that are a close fit, yeah. you're going to struggle. Yeah. But if we have a little bit of a, a guide, it just makes it easy. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It's, it's that tactile engineering, right? Yeah. So, well, it's, it's amazing too. Like when you get something in your hand like this, and especially if you've seen older iterations of the M or even old Omnivaps compared to the new M, like the Omni seems archaic sort of thing. But you know, I just remember back when people weren't that familiar with Dynavap. I think you guys have have well proved the value proposition at this point of the product. But you know, you oh, it's a tube of metal. It's just a, t a tube of like. That's pretty reductive at this point. It like, is a tube of metal. It is a tube of metal. Yep. Sure. And a car is, you know, the metal yeah, and plastic. It's just metal and rubber. Yeah, exactly, right? And then you have a Ferrari. And it's just right. like, no, it's just the intricacy and the detail and the engineering and the refinement that's taken place in the product. It's been just really interesting to see your guys' skills develop as a company. Because you, I'm sure you would have liked to make this product 10 years ago, but you Absolutely. couldn't. You didn't, you didn't know how. Didn't know you, how. Didn't, you didn't have the equipment, the knowledge, the know-how, the infrastructure, the people. Like. Or, or even the ability to see what we could possibly do, right? Because this is, what, this is how knowledge works, right? You can't invent something, okay, without an understanding of the necessary components that go into creating it. Yeah. Right? So again, if we think sure. about just technological progression, right? How could the transistor be invented before electricity? Yeah. Right. How do you how do you make the TV before a TV camera? Or... Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's these simple things, right? And yet here we're talking about a simple tube of metal. Yeah. Yes. It's like. But it's okay. a simple tube of metal that <laughs> empowers the user with almost magical. Uh, capability, right? I can use this simple tube of metal to selectively extract a group of compounds at my will. Indefinitely. Repeatably. Yeah. You know? And all I need is something that's hot. I can do that. <laughs> I don't know why, but it I just makes me smile, right? Yeah. yeah. With well, this silly little metal tube. You guys have created something here, and... Finally, I want to switch you units here because I want you to talk a little bit okay. just about, first of all, this is something that is going to have a great close-up. Like the way that it just, it's like, this is what I mean about the precision. You know, you've gone to the, like the kind of car door that you just have to go like that and it's sort of like those, the drawers that close themselves, you know, yes, like. The, the, the little, the little details. I'm going to hold this one because I like to right. touch it. it. Sure. It, <laughs> I'm the same way. It, and, it, and it comes down to those details, right? Because when we think about the things that we really, really like, whether we're talking about the music from an artist, okay, or we're talking about a product, it's not specifically the music or the product, you know. I love all smartphones. No. You tend, if you love smartphones, there's probably one in particular that you like. Yeah. Why? Because of certain details, okay. In the end, it's the details that make the difference, okay. And... That's what we've learned along the way. And it's what you're going to find, you know, with our more refined products, right? So whether we're talking about uh, the O-ring spacing on the tips, well, hmm, let's look at the mouthpiece. And we look at the mouthpiece, uh, you can find that the O-ring spacings are Same. standardized, right? And what this means is mm. when I'm taking and plugging in my mouthpiece, okay, or I'm plugging in my tip, hmm. Okay. Wow. I'm getting not just a tactile feedback, but I'm getting audio feedback as well. Yeah. Okay. And it just helps make sure that things are integrated, right? Having the O-rings and having mating grooves specifically for those O-rings in the stem wow. means I actually get substantially better retention, okay? Than because just the pressure. Than this sliding them into a tube that's the right size. Mm, okay? That makes sense. And it also helps hold things in position so it would drift and other various things 
it also feels really nice when it goes yeah. together because again, it's it's a detail. Right? Yes. You know, yeah. Like like a hand grip that fits your hand versus just a round rod that right. fits in your hand. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. You know, we look at hammers, for example. Hammers that were made a hundred years ago. Well, they had a round wood handle. Yeah. So you can pick it up. You can swing them. You pick up a hammer today at the supply store, Home Depot, or what it might be. And you might find a custom molded grip that fits your hand really nice, mm. right? And I bet it's way nicer to use. It's way nicer to use. You know, it's got shock absorption, that sort of thing. Creates less fatigue. You need a new hammer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so this is just evolution. So moving on to the M7 XL, right? We wanted a simple M for the people that were looking for streamline, simple. Don't want anything that doesn't really need to be there in our function. But we also knew that there's people that have purchased multiple M's from us and they liked the differences in the variants and they wanted something that was going to maybe offer just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's do something we haven't done before. Let's create a stainless steel mouthpiece. Okay, nice little bit of mass. Yeah. Okay. Let's use a similar attachment form factor to do with the woodwind because that worked out pretty good both yeah. with the O rings and with the uh, condenser that holds itself into the mouthpiece. Okay. And hmm, let's also incorporate this feature that I absolutely love, and that is, okay, chamber size. Positioning the CCD, been a problem. You created a product to help solve that problem, yeah. okay? I actually really like that product <laughs> because it not only solves the problem, again, for people that struggle with the placement, it also puts a little bit more mass in the chamber, yeah. okay? Which kind of gets us to part of moving the mass around a little bit, right? Yeah. Well, now we can take this mouthpiece, we can plug it in, we can take the condenser, oh, okay, look at that. and just like this, Okay. We've now positioned the CCD exactly at the half bowl wow. position, exactly in the right orientation because the CCD was always intended to be positioned from the bottom moving upward right. to create a little bit of a dome which functions like an arch. Okay, It's self-supporting so that when you're pushing on it, uh, and I'll just use the mouthpiece to kind of lightly push, it holds itself in place really, really well with yeah. a surprising amount of force. Yeah. Okay, But when we push on it from the bottom side, it's a piece of cake to pop it sure. out. Sure. Okay. Also, we can then drop it in like this. We can use the mouthpiece to then push it all the way down until it clicks into the bottom. Okay. So, okay, what's the term I'm looking for when you're cutting wood and you have a thing so they're all the same size? What do they call that? Cutting wood. Oh, like just a... Uh, There's just a term I'm looking for there. I was, I was hoping I could describe it. With... So, in, in machining, we call it a stop. A know, stop. Okay. Right. So yeah, something like that. Right. But it's just like it's something that sits there, and then you line the wood up, you cut it, line the wood up, cut it. It's the yep. same size, right? Because yeah. that's like what you have there. Like it's the same sort of thing. It, that... it largely is, right? You know, whether we're talking about the groove that the CCD lands in, or we're talking about the tool that's also the mouthpiece that yeah. functions to either push it down or to flip it around and position it precisely, I like that. right where it needs to be. Okay, I don't even need to look at it. This is the beautiful thing. I don't need to use my eyes to get my CCD exactly where I want mm. it to be because, oh, the tool is built into the device. Smart. And I, I, I think like it's that. fantastic, you know, when, when we can take the parts that we're already making for the device and we can give them more than one function. To me, that's a hallmark of thoughtful design. Yeah. Oh, totally. I, and I like to say it's the details, you know, it's the little details that, sh like, I always find it amazing when, um, I'll get a device and it is a pain in the ass to load. Right. Every time I load it, it's a struggle. And I'm just like, but didn't you think about that when you were making it? Like, this is some, this is the only way you can use the thing. You yeah, can't, it's gotta be loaded so you can use it. You can't use this if you don't load it and it's a pain in the butt to load it, you know? So it's like, that is, that's unthoughtful design. That's just like, right. figure it out. You'll figure it out. There's, you know, just kind of, uh, you just, you know, it's that, like. That, that's the the differentiator between people that are designing with intent and people that, again, in my opinion, when you make a device that solves a problem, some a lot of times it's interesting for yourself. It's like, you know what? I don't like the options that are out there. Yeah. Okay. And this is inventor speak. I'm going to fix it. 
I'm going to fix it. I don't like that. I'm going to fix yeah. it. Why? Because I don't like that, so I'm going to fix it. Okay? And someone else, you hey, know, this works better. What did you do? Well, I didn't like that, so I fixed it. Right. Oh, you know, someone else might like that. Okay, cool. Right? And whether we're talking about product design, we're talking about music, it doesn't really matter what the creative intent or purpose is. When you've got a creator that is intent specifically on making something that solves a problem and something that they really, really care about, they want to make it as good as they possibly can, Yeah. well, that means the intent is placed in the right location, right? When the intent is to make a product that sells really well, well, then you have pop music. <laughs> right, and you have the Marvel franchise yeah, that everyone... Yeah. And I'm not trying to be derogatory towards anybody when yeah. I say it that no, way. No, I hear you. But there, there's a big difference between whether... Because, again, the line between art and product and commerce, it starts to get a little bit blurry here. Yeah. But when the primary intent is to make something that the person is making it really truly cares about and wants to make it as good as they possibly can, it's very different than the intent of how do we make something that as many people as possible will buy it. Right. Right. Designing it just strictly it's, for a revenue producing it's, vehicle it's kind of totally thing. Totally different intent. You know, and I think our products fall outside of the specifically to make money category because we're trying to make products that last for generations. We're trying to make products that work really well, products that feel good between the fingers, products that are satisfying to use. And as more of the world becomes aware of the thermal extraction process, products that change people's lives and give them the opportunity to shift just a little bit, retain the ritual, which has so much value in terms of what we do is we go through the process and we prepare ourselves and we prepare our product for consumption, consume what we're looking for carefully and with intent, and then carry on with that next chapter of our life versus, oh, that looks good, I'm going to buy it and consume it. Yeah. Just different intent. So yeah. back to the mouthpiece. So another thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to give people some more capability, right? We've seen, uh, you know, of course, the Omni originally introduced the variable air and vapor ratio. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we took it to a different level with the Vong and the Vong I, where we twisted a little bit to kind of open and close yeah. the airport. And, of course, there was always the hack where you could slide the O-rings around the condenser and construct yeah. or just vary the air floor right. just a little bit. So, well, why don't we just make the condenser slide in and out of the mouthpiece and also how do we know where we want to be because well we could put grooves in they got to count them but here's the problem you have to have eyes that can see the grooves right mm. so knowing exactly how far you want your condenser to come out of the mouthpiece to change the interface between the condenser and the tip well oh. how about this how about we slide it in and what if we make a little tactile detent yeah that I can go one two Three. I like it at three. Or maybe I want it at four. Wow. Maybe I want it at two. But I can I can pull it out and I can just start to slowly slide it in and go one, two, three. Right. <laughs> that feels about right. That's see, this is why it's always so interesting, you know, getting to talk to George. You know, I'm I'm sure a lot of you people would love to sit down with George and ask him questions just you know, I, I noticed that it had this clicking, and I just like, oh, that's cool. It's, you know, it kind of clicks in there, but it's like now it clicks, and it's like, oh, this is actually a design feature that, you know, yes. like a, quite an, like, that's quite an advancement as compared to how it's been done. I, I think it's a, a pretty nice shift because now most people clean their devices, at least occasionally. Yeah. Right? You should. So that means I'm probably going to take it apart. So I can clean it, whether I'm going to soak it or Q-tip it out, whatever it might be. Yeah. But now I can put it back together in one, two, three. And I can put my setup back together and have that same, here's kind of a little example, right? Yeah. So you can see how much far it's actually going to stick into sure. the tip, which is going to change your airflow characteristics. And now I'm right back to the way it was when I had it just the way I wanted it. Yeah. 
just like that. Wow. Just like that. It's crazy when, you know, I, I go back in time and I remember, um, you know, and especially back in the day when you had the tips with the four O-rings, sometimes you'd have a third party stem and it's like, it was a battle to get those things it in was. there. So i like, you had to get the first one in there just right and then gently twist. And then it's seeded in there and it's like, don't touch it. It's perfect, you know? Yep. And then now it's just, you're just like, click, click, click. And just all along the way, it's a tactile confirmation vision, you know, uh, audio confirmation, like yes. and, you know, the visuals there too. Yeah. But uh, again, one of the things that I did not understand anywhere near on the level that I do now, five years ago, how important the tactile interface really is. Yeah. And and I think that it's it's something that I think more companies are finally coming to realization on. Okay. But I still think that there aren't many that are there yet. Yeah. Okay, there just aren't that many because we are such visual thinkers, especially yeah. these days where there's a screen on everything. Yeah. You know, we're, what good is a, uh, an LCD screen if you can't see it? Yeah. Right? This is no, no, you can't no, control no, purpose, the right? no. So, how nice is it when I can take this thing apart and without even looking down, I can reset my condenser. The exact same way, yeah. And I can put it all back together, and I can make sure that, oh, yep, I'm good to go. <laughs> it's like cleaning a rifle blindfolded kind of thing. Because it's been designed and engineered specifically to have a nice tactile interface that makes it easy for a person yeah. to feel their way around. Because our sense of touch, I think, tends to play. Uh, Almost like a a backseat role to our sense of sight. Yeah. Right? Even though, under some circumstances, our sense of touch is actually far, far more accurate. Yeah. Okay. And more sensitive. Yeah. Now, I can't see you with my fingers if I'm not touching you. Okay. But what I can do is I can feel the difference between the surface of this table and a piece of paper. Yeah. Okay. Even if there's no light. Yeah. Right? Okay. I can take my fingernail and I can scrape across the surface and I can feel a scratch that is just a fraction of the depth of a single hair. Yeah. It's that's right, right there. Okay. You can't see that. But, but I, I may not be able to see it unless the light's just right. Yeah. Okay. And so what I'm getting at is our sense of touch is kind of like this unsung hero in terms of our ability to interface with the universe. And so I've kind of made it like my own personal mission to engineer the tactile interface to the best of my ability with the products that I have the opportunity to play a role in designing, right? Yeah. And I think that is a huge component that differentiates what we make with a lot of the other things that are out there, whether it's in the same category or if we're talking about just some of the other consumer products that you're going to find in a convenience store, for example. Yeah. But we are seeing it start to show up. Okay. For example, uh, think of the energy drinks, right? I think Monster was one of the first ones that did this. They started to apply a finish on the can Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that you can feel, yeah. right? And I, and I like it. <laughs> huh. You can't even really see it, but you pick it up and all of a sudden... Yeah. I've never felt a can like that yeah. before. Crabs your attention because it hadn't been there before. Well, that's what we're trying to do with the geometry that we machine in, as well as some of the textures that we create. Yeah. And, and same thing, you know, with, you know, I, I really like the faceted mouthpiece too. Yeah. It is, it's a really um, sharp looking mouthpiece, I think. It's, and it, it feels nice too, right? It's not, it's, it's not just fun. looks cool, it feels nice. Now, I just realized I forgot to ask you tip capacity on this one. Is it a standardized thing or are they slightly different on this one? Okay, so this is a pretty interesting question. So the tip capacities, I'm going to create like a little bit of a sine wave here. They've shifted a little bit over the years yeah. from uh, the earlier tips that some people really prefer, say, for example, the seven fin titanium tips. Yeah. Okay to the five fins and then into the original M tips and then the M plus and now here okay 
the total volume inside the tip, again, is shifted. But in general, it's been a very small shift, a little bit more, a little bit less, as we've been shifting the mass around, working on some of the internal, some of the external geometries. The volume of this tip is going to be very, very comparable to the tips that we've made from the seven fin tip, almost identical. Yeah. Okay. To the M plus tip, maybe a, a single digit percentage smaller. Right. Okay. A little tiny bit. Okay. Are you going to notice it? Mm, I doubt it. Right. Okay. Because if your moisture content shifts by five to seven percent, you could put the exact same volume in there and the mass is going to shift by more than what it would shift even if you pack right. it exactly the same by the tiny little bit. Okay. We're talking about, again, same amount of material, a hundredth of a gram or less yeah. in terms of difference. Right. Okay. So to be totally transparent, is it different? Yes, it is. Yeah. However, uh, I think what most people are going to find is, hmm, this tip does some things my other tips haven't done before in terms of the way it heats, the way it holds the heat, the way it doesn't transfer as much heat to the stem, mm -hmm. right? The way that I can pretty easily and comfortable get a single cycle extraction, or I can still chase the flavor if I want. Okay, I'm liking that. And and I am always an advocate for the half bowl position too, because oh, yes. you know, not just because the half bowl converter, I made the half bowl converter for the love of the half bowl, right? Because you know, I, I'm I, I think a really good analogy that I heard is the espresso analogy as compared to coming into the break room after a 12 hour shift and shift and there's a cup of coffee or a pot of coffee that's been heating up for eight hours. It's a different process. And if you look at like espresso yes. nerds, they're yes. crazy yes. about their espresso well, they are. process. And they don't want espresso that was pressed yeah. four hours ago. No. No, no, no. It's uh, right now. No, I want to grind the beans. And then do it, not take the stuff that was ground a month ago yeah. out of the refrigerator yeah. and put it in there, press it, and then set it on the counter for a few hours to cool off. <laughs> put it in the microwave, heat it up, you know. Yeah, yeah. you know, it's, there's differences. And I, I really mirror what, what your sentiment is regarding the, the half, is now we can put a little bit less in and we can get a more complete extraction in one cycle. Yeah. And then the next time we load it, we can... Again, get that whole extraction all at once. The other thing we get that's really fun is when we look at it from the side view, yeah. and we put the half bowl here, mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're creating a little bit of a space or a gap between yeah. all the mass here that's going to hold all the heat okay, yeah, and the material while you're heating it up. So it reduces the amount of conduction that's going into mm -hmm. your material prior to getting all of the mass up temperature, and then we can use that mass to preheat that airstream and get a nice complete extraction wow. real quick. Yes. So I personally feel that when the device is used in the half chamber configuration, it tends to be surprisingly flavorful and has a taste profile that's more along the lines of what you'd expect from a convection style vaporizer. Yeah. Well, and I also think if you were to do a, a blind test and on 10 people, and if they had to guess if it was a half bowl hit or a full bowl hit, I don't think most people could tell from an experienced operator is, kind of thing. Is, like it's, yeah, someone some knows how to heat it. Yeah, exactly. Like if you know how to heat it, you can make your half bowl seem like a lot of people are hitting a full bowl. And it's just you, I find it the best taste, but best effects too, because you're just, this is what the plant has to offer. When you heat the plant up and then reheat it, it's not the same. It, it clearly isn't the same thing. So you're not... You're not vaping the same bowl twice. Your second session on it, or third, or fourth, it's, it's all different. very, very different. So, but I'm also a huge, you know, I mean, I say I'm a huge weed snob, but it's just like, okay, maybe, but maybe I just have a really appreciation or a real appreciation for the plant, and I want the best it has to offer, and that's that's how I get a better experience. I, I very much agree with that approach because uh, it, it allows us to really dial things in in kind of a fun way. And I think it gets even more fun when we allow the fluid dynamics of this simple metal tube, right, to kind of do what they were designed to do. And that is, heat this thing up, okay, 
yeah, go ahead, make some adjustments if you like. But let the airport breathe. Yeah. Okay. You want to obstruct a little bit to get things going? A lot of people like that. And there's actually some good reasoning behind doing it, even yeah. though it's not technically necessary. But the thing that I find so interesting when I'm able to observe this directly with people is like, here, I'm going to heat this for you. I'm going to give it to you. And when I hand it to you, I want you to just forget about everything else. Okay, Put it in your mouth. Forget that the airport even exists. And just hit it. Yeah. And hit it hard. Yeah. Okay, Because it can keep up. I guarantee it. Yeah. And when they finish, it's like, wow, it tasted really good. And then when the exhale comes out and they see, where did that come from? <laughs> what? I, it's it's I had that shock. Ex- I had that exact same experience with you. Like, okay. I think maybe you're describing a scenario with me because I remember that exactly. You were just like, here, just just do it. But, like, don't be shy. You don't, you don't have just, to, Just like, go. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, you can you can do that. That's right. so, not what I thought. Because it's very, very different from a smoking device where we want to plug the carb yeah. so we can get a good draw, we can get a good burn, and yeah. create good thick smoke yeah. and just make it function. Yeah. Okay. When we leave it open, we actually allow the not only the fluid dynamics but the thermodynamics to work more in our favor. Okay. And to further elaborate on that. When the oven's hot, okay, the active compounds are in a state where they're ready to evaporate. Yeah. But there's this interesting thing called dew point. And it doesn't just apply to water. Yeah. It applies to effectively anything that can evaporate. Okay? okay. Once the environment around that material that can evaporate becomes saturated, okay, the air literally cannot hold any more material that would evaporate. It just yeah. can't do it. It's saturated. So what do we need to do? We need to displace the saturated air that contains the vapor out of the way so fresh air can come into the oven or the extraction chamber so more of the volatile compounds that are in there can then evaporate and be extracted. Okay. So it's what I refer to as displacement. Okay. So when we leave the airport open, we get a significant amount of air that comes in and it creates just enough of a venturi Okay to allow some air to come underneath the cap and displace the vapor that's being produced without forcing a whole bunch of excess air to come through there, which then cools down our material and cools mm-hmm. down our tip faster than is necessary. Okay, And so what this means is it means your extraction chamber and the material that's contained within it stays at extraction temperature longer, producing more and more vapor mm-hmm. as we displace the produced vapor from the extraction chamber with just enough air to get it out of the way without cooling things down more than necessary so more of those active compounds, your terpenes, your flavonoids, your cannabinoids, they can all then phase change into a state which then they can be transported down that little condenser tube right where you want them to be. Into your happy little lungs. Exactly. (laughs) Well, there we go. Well, George, I think that was a pretty fascinating discussion. Um, I certainly am much more educated about the device, and I'm sure everyone watching is as well. Um, super, super cool new product. I'm always amazed to see what you guys are able to do with, um, you know, an idea that's been around for a while, and it's just gotten so much better with time. So really appreciate you spending the time with me today, and great job with this brand new M7 and M7 XL. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Thank Good you very stuff. much.